So we're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. I'll begin reading in verse 21, and I'm going to uh, skip three verses then and pick back up in 25, and next week we will pick up with the other part of this story. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be made whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Well, this is a remarkable story of a certain day in the life of Jesus. I skipped over verses 22 through 24 until our, last, uh, until our next lesson in the Gospel of Mark. I want to study that other remarkable story on its own. Jesus had not stepped off the boat and gone very far before one of the rulers of the synagogue of Capernaum came to beg for a miracle. That's what we'll be talking about next week. But as Jesus was on the way with him, his name was Jairus, as he went on, the multitude just was pressing about them. And before they reached the man's house where his daughter lay dying, Mark tells us this story of this desperate woman. Before we get to that, have you, have you ever had a dream and woke up mad at somebody because of what they did in the dream? <laughs> Mostly ladies laughing at that kind of thing. Uh, but you can't always trust your dreams, even if you can learn something from them. I actually had a dream about these scriptures. I woke up Thursday morning to check out what I thought I had learned. I've mentioned before that I like to study what all of the Gospels say about a particular event. Some events are covered by only one Gospel, some by two, some by three, some by all four. The Gospel of John was written by that apostle in his old age, long after Mark was inspired to write. John's inspiration blew down from heaven through a long lifetime of profound and intimate contemplation of Jesus and all the things that he did and said. And in my dream, John had also written of this incident, and the name of the woman was Eunice. And as I considered this, I thought in my dream on how I might preach. I was just delighted. Oh boy, I'm going to preach on this. But it was good to remember the faith of those who went before and, and to recall their names and their lives to new generations. I thought about my grand, uh, great-grandmother, Amanda. I never met her, but uh, they say that she was such a devout woman that she couldn't even say the word God without trembling. She was so reverent. She died in her sleep with a Bible folded up on her chest. That's the way to go. And that's a great story to tell about somebody named Amanda, who I never knew. I never met her, but that story lived down. I've got her Bible. At any rate, I wanted to uh, immediately go to a Bible. This is in my dream. I wanted to go to a Bible and look up this woman, Phyllis and read what I thought. And at that point in my dream, I realized that I didn't know whether her name was Eunice or Phyllis. And I knew at that moment I was dreaming. Did John even write about her at all? And that question woke me up. And I remembered Psalm 1, 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, 
and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Let me say, if you should ever dream about the Bible at night, be sure to consult it by the light of day. (laughs) The next morning, when I was pretty sure I was awake, that's normally after a cup of coffee or two, I consulted the Bible and I found that my dream memory was faulty. John did not write about Eunice. John did not write about Phyllis. John did not write about either one of them. And he also did not write about this woman who touched the clothes of Jesus in Capernaum on that day. Then I thought on how it is certainly good to remember the faith of certain individuals and communities. But sometimes it's good if we don't know their name. We didn't have a need to know in this same passage written on that same day in this exact same place. We are told the name of the synagogue ruler. His name was Jairus. We're told his name. It was an important verification of the story for the people of that day who could go back and talk to Jairus, who could go back and talk to his daughter who was 12 years old and who lay dying at that time. But in this life, we don't need to know the names of each and every person who has believed on Jesus and their story of faith. We will have all eternity to learn that kind of a thing. I think it would be a temptation in this lifetime, a temptation into a kind of religion of ancestor worship where where we reverence the dead and the stories of the dead and what they did in their lives more than we care about the living. In cultures where they revere their ancestors to that extent, it can be that way. It would have been simple enough for the name of each person whom Jesus touched to be made known. But the Holy Spirit inspired the gospel writers to mention some by name and to leave others anonymous, like most all of us. Despite my dream, I don't need to know this lady's name. Now, when I get there, I'm going to want to find out. (laughs) I I am going to want to know that's how my mind was made to work details matter and for the rest of my life I'm going to wonder well was her name Eunice was it Phyllis or was it something else I'm going to wonder about that for the rest of my life I think I was given two names so that I wouldn't think on it too much so that I wouldn't get puffed up God revealed to me the name of this woman you know I don't know her name I got Phyllis I got Eunice I have no idea who she was but it's enough to know that she suffered and she was desperate and that she put her faith in Jesus. That's what we needed to know about her. Now, not many of us can put ourselves in the sandals of the uh, synagogue ruler, Jairus. It doesn't hurt for us to know his name. We will probably never, most of us, God help us, we will never have to go begging to Jesus to bring a child back from the brink of death. We're certainly not likely to be praying for him to raise the dead. But we can all of us feel very deeply for such situations. And we can identify, certainly, with that poor, desperate woman who sought after Jesus on that day. Uh, Perhaps we don't need to know her name because she could have been any one of us. We all have our times of, uh, of desperation. A few years ago, I I acquired an ear infection, and it was one of the most truly painful times of my life, and it went on for months. It went on for months. I spent hundreds of dollars on clinic visits, on prescriptions, and no effect. I tried every home remedy that I could find. I consulted Dr. Google and, uh, and I looked up all kinds of things. I couldn't walk down the freezer aisle or the refrigerated section there in the supermarket without just this terrible pain in my ear. I had to cover up any time I was walking the dog. Uh, if the air conditioner was blowing in the car, it was just blowing knives into my head through my ear. Nothing was working. Uh, One day, Melissa had to go to another doctor on another matter, and I just said, look, ask him if he's got any ideas. And he asked if I had tried pouring vinegar in my ear. Some of you may have already thought about that, but you know, everything I had read, and trust me, I read a lot about ear infections during those weeks. 
Lower the pH. Use baking soda. Use hydrogen peroxide sparingly. Use alcohol. Try this expensive antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial solution. One medical website after another, one forum after another. No answers. Literally no answers. No medical professional anywhere on the internet that I had found had suggested vinegar, not one. It was the opposite advice. But this particular uh, doctor is also a chiropractor. He's more used to thinking outside of the box. And at that point, I'd already proven that I was willing to try anything. How many of you have ever shoved a clove of garlic in your ear? <laughs> there was a snowbird who told me that worked for one of his buddies one time, so I tried it. I didn't see how a little bit of vinegar would hurt, so, uh, and it didn't hurt a bit. The condition cleared up almost right away. Within three days, I felt like I was just about completely cured. All, after all the money, after all the visits, after all the home remedies, I just needed to uh, increase the acid level in my ear, lower the pH, and kill the fungus. Vinegar, household vinegar. It was right there in the pantry. I smelled like a salad, but it worked. <laughs> now, that wasn't faith. That was desperation. That was just desperation. And finally running across a physician who, without even looking at me, considered what the cause of the problem might be and how to treat it. All the rest of the learned doctors in the clinics who saw me, even the specialists on the internet, they were consulting laboratory results and studies of lots of people and pharmaceutical catalogs to find pills and chemical solutions that, in the, in, that the industry's statistical studies indicated to be products most likely to be effective in most circumstances. Expensive prescriptions were written, more ineffective products were sold, and I was still in pain and spending money without relief. I, uh, I can relate somewhat to that woman who could not stop bleeding. But I recall a woman I once knew who had suffered even more than I had. Rhonda was her name. This is a real woman named Rhonda. I was serving as an interim pastor, and it was... Um, my first ever such position in a church that was in a terrible fix. Rhonda was just an ordinary woman in those parts, no better or worse than any other uh, lady. She loved Jesus, but perhaps had not always led the most disciplined life. At this time, she was working menial jobs, just trying to make ends meet. But she wound up with an abscess in her jaw following some dental work that she couldn't afford. And because she lacked the money, the condition got worse. And before she knew it, an infection had built up. It moved up her eustachian tube. It had completely eaten her eardrum away. She had become deaf in that ear and was just in a lot more pain than I just described. She sat in the lobby of the church there because I did not meet single ladies in my office. She sat in the lobby talking with me and she was just weeping from the pain. And as she was telling me these things, her ear just suddenly bled out this nasty mess on her arm and then she just began to bawl from embarrassment and from the agony that she was suffering. Now she knew the church didn't have any money Everyone in the area knew what kind of a state that church was in at that time. The previous pastor had nearly destroyed the fellowship with his unrepentant adultery and his machinations to hold on to power. Reminds me of a certain governor. We were broke, we were struggling, and holding on by a thread. Now, inexperienced as I was, uh, I didn't know any better than to just preach the Bible and to preach faith in Jesus, Rhonda didn't come asking for money, you see. Oh, it was worse than that, and it was a lot scarier. I could tell her I didn't have any money. She came asking for a miracle. She was desperate. She came to a Baptist church asking for a miracle. Now, I'm an ignorant fellow. I really am. People come up to me all the time. Have you read such and such book by such and such author? No. Well, have you heard of them? No. <laughs> I haven't. I read the Bible. I read the news. 
and uh, I read history. I don't read the latest fads that are being pushed by the Christian publishing industry in the, in the Christian bookstores. Um, so uh, I, I don't know what everybody else is thinking and doing out there. And at that time, I did not know that God does not perform miracles anymore. I didn't know that after the apostolic age, it doesn't happen. I had uh, not been to a seminary to teach me that miracles were most likely made up or misunderstood by the unsophisticated people of ancient days. I grew up in old country churches where we were taught to believe in the Bible. I didn't know any better than to tell her what the Bible said. And the brother of Jesus in his epistle wrote in James 5.14, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. I told Rhonda that I couldn't promise that it would work, but I encouraged her to have faith and to demonstrate it by asking for this thing. I prepared some oil, and I told the old men who ran the church what to expect, and that Sunday morning, Rhonda came up at the invitation at the end of the service. She was anointed with oil and prayed over in the name of Jesus, and she passed out, just literally fainted, slumping over forward, where she sat into the arms of a lady who sat by her as the church reverently prayed. I remind you, this was a Southern Baptist church. I want you to know that I didn't slap her on the forehead and knock her head over heel so her center of gravity forced her to fall backwards. Uh, we weren't playing loud music. We weren't whipping up the crowd into an emotional frenzy. We weren't proclaiming the power of the Holy Ghost. We weren't doing that. We were just quietly, solemnly, scripturally, faithfully, prayerfully, decently, and in order doing what the Bible said to do so that Jesus would get the glory for whatever happened. Rhonda soon awoke. The service was dismissed, and she felt a certain relief. When she went back to the doctor the next day, he was amazed. He had never seen an eardrum grow completely back. There was no scar tissue, no evidence that there had ever even been an infection. None of the men who prayed over her got any credit for it. The church did not immediately have a sudden revival as people came flocking in for Holy Ghost miracles, chasing after signs and wonders. But Rhonda tells everyone what Jesus did for her. Once in a while, I get to tell people what I saw Jesus do as well for a woman who was in pain, desperate, and destitute. I was too ignorant to know that Jesus doesn't heal people in this day and time. Stupid as I am, I just believed what the Bible said about Jesus. As weak and as doubtful and as lacking in faith as we were at that church, Jesus was faithful. He healed his sister that daughter of heaven who cried out to him in faith. The Gospels tell us of the desperation and of the terrible condition of this woman who dared to reach out through this crowd of people to touch the robe of Nat Jesus of Nazareth. You know, I, I wonder if she was a widow. We're told that she spent all that she had as if she was, you know, the head of her own household. She had suffered under many physicians who hadn't made her any better. They made her worse. In the 12 years that led to that moment, she just continued to bleed and bleed and bleed. She had to be weak and weary all the time, probably subject to any cold or flu that passed through the area. And in that day and in that place, a woman who was constantly bleeding in that manner might also be treated as someone who was unclean, perhaps even someone who was accursed of God. In the law of Moses, Leviticus, in chapter 15, verse 25, we read, And if a woman have an issue of blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. It goes on to say, don't touch her, don't touch her clothes, don't touch anything she sits on or lays on, or you'll be unclean too. For one week out of every month, adult women were considered ritually unclean. 
If her period was irregular, the law covered that, but this poor woman was considered unclean for all of the last 12 years of her life. She couldn't go to synagogue. She couldn't have normal relations with other people in a day when everyone strove with all religious fervor to avoid being ritually unclean. In those days, the dietary and hygiene regimens of the law of Moses kept the Israelites cleaner and healthier than the people in other lands. The law was more than just religious ritual, it was a necessary prevention of diseases and epidemics. This woman was not only suffering in her health and in her daily struggle to stay clean and in her costly visits to doctors who made things worse, she also suffered because she couldn't be a part of the community like everyone else. She couldn't worship with the others. She could not offer her sacrifices that she believed would atone for her sins. She was tortured, not just physically, but socially, mentally, financially, spiritually. For 12 years, she had endured this with no help, with no prospect for improvement, and no money left for her needs. Her desperation at that point must have been terrible. It was so much that she pushed through the crowd, And all who touched her, all whom she touched, were at risk of becoming unclean, at least for the day. Weak, suffering, she only wanted to touch the edge of the garment that Jesus wore. In her faith, she believed that there was such power and such virtue in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that even touching his clothes would be enough to heal her of what no doctor could. And it was. What a fear she must have had, though. Unclean though she was, risking who could say what approbation and hostility from the crowd whom she had been helpless to avoid touching, Jesus was always surrounded by a pressing crowd of people whenever he was in Capernaum. She could only reach him that way through them or not at all. Now, I've heard of people called faith healers. I actually knew a man who claimed that the power to heal was placed by God into his own two hands, that there was something special about his two hands. I have seen cloths touched by TV ministers and sold for donations. I have heard the name of the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost shouted and glorified. I have seen crowds gathering for what was billed as an ongoing Holy Spirit revival. But I have rarely seen lasting good come out of any of that. The Holy Spirit of Almighty God glorifies Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit does not glorify itself. The Holy Spirit glorifies the Son of God. The miraculous healing power of God, the power to resist the devil, the power to cast out demons, the power to stop a storm on the seas, the power to raise the dead are not invested in the hands of preachers or in the sacraments of priests. The power of the creator and the sustainer of all things is not found that way. The power of almighty God the Father is in Jesus. When that poor, desperate woman touched the robe of that carpenter from Nazareth, the power did not flow out of hand-woven fabric. The virtue and power flowed out of Jesus himself. That's what we're asking for. When we pray for people who have desperate conditions, when we pray for people to be healed, when we pray for the finances of people, when we pray for people to come to faith, when we pray for people to return to their families, when we pray for broken hearts to be healed, we are praying for the power of Jesus Christ to touch their lives and change things and heal things. Don't get lost, people. Remember, it's all about Jesus, and it's all about Jesus receiving the credit for these things. Everywhere in the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles and throughout the Bible, when you see signs and wonders, they always point to Jesus Christ. Jesus felt the power flow from him, and he looked about to find the woman who had touched his clothes, not accidentally in the crowd, not just for the sake of having done it like a groupie, ooh, I touched his clothes, 
She reached out to him in humility and in faith, and Jesus knew it. This is important. I don't know if her name was Phyllis or Eunice or something else entirely, but she was known to Jesus in that moment as she is known to him now. He is not some impersonal manifestation of some aspect of the triune Godhead. Jesus of Nazareth is a living, breathing person who connects with each and every one of us personally. Jesus knows very well when we reach out in faith to him. For Jesus, it's personal. He's moved with compassion for our sicknesses and our pain and our griefs and our struggles. Jesus loves us, and he will help us as only he can, but we do have to reach out to him. The woman was healed. She was made whole. Jesus said that it was her faith that accomplished this. His power was released from his person to her person, from the Son of God to a daughter of heaven, Because she had faith in Jesus, in her humility, she knew it was not about the strength and determination of her own faith. She only wanted to touch the edge of his robe. Her faith was completely in Jesus. And because of that, the people saw a woman who had been unclean for 12 years made clean and whole by the Son of God. We don't speak of the faith of Phyllis. We speak of faith in Jesus. Jesus alone is worth all of the honor and all of the praise. I don't need to know the name of that woman. I only need to know who she placed her faith in. When we desperately need that help, that help that only the Son of God can provide, reach out to him. Reach out in faith. And it's not a measure of your faith. It's not whether I have strong faith. No, the tiniest bit of faith is enough. Just reach out to him so that people will know what Jesus has done for you and what Jesus has done for others. They may not remember your name. They may not remember our names or our faces, but the honor that Jesus receives will shine forever, and he will know personally who gave that to him.